All right, welcome to CS4510. Uh, this is the last lecture. It's on Karp Lipton theorems. Uh, I, my motivation for teaching this is simply the fact that Car Dick Lipton used to be a professor here. I think that's cool. You could really co cover anything. The, the Karp Lipton theorem is a very complicated statement, but the proof is actually not too, not too hard. And it involves the polynomial time hierarchy. Uh, Karp, you probably know, did the famous 20, first 21 MP complete problems. He was the first. He was the second person he re to realize, uh, well, you know, Steve Cook proved SAT was MP-complete. Uh, Karp proved 21 related problems that were MP-complete. So he was, he's known for this. Um, so the polynomial time hierarchy, again, we have a picture of it here. It's this big, beautiful, infinitely hierarchy of classes of stuff. And we've mentioned uh, that it's contained in p-space. So if I were to draw a Venn diagram, and uh, I'll limit myself to doing so, perhaps it looks like this. This whole thing is pH, and we know that pH is contained in what? P space, right? So what is the relation? It turns out it's situated in such a nice place that it can very, it's very useful to help us tell us the relationships with all the other problems. Um, pH, the levels of the polynomial time hierarchy were invented to help classify certain problems that are natural, but not obviously in um, NP or NP complete. Clique, we all remember what clique is, right? Clique, clique is this problems. Maybe we we formulate it as a decision problem. You're given G and K such that a G has a clique of size uh, greater than or equal to K, right? How can you? Why is clique in NP? Undeterministically guess the clique and then check if it's a clique. Yeah, or or deterministically verify a clique. Just check if the clique the the, the the witness is the clique. You just check if it is a clique and it's of size greater than k. Uh, this is clique is also NP complete. You can prove the reduction from SAT. It's not too hard. There's a 3510 video on this. Uh, the problem exact clique. is equal to uh, g comma k. And the largest clique in G is of size exactly K. Okay. This is a problem which no one really thinks it's NP complete, but because it, it appears in the definition of it to require an additional quantifier. So when we say a problem, this is in NP. You know, this is NNP because you can quantify this with a single quantifier. This one appears to require two quantifiers. The two quantifiers are basically like um, there exists some C such that, and C here is a subset of V such that I could write this like uh, uh, C is a subset of V, C, the size of C is greater than or equal to K, and um, I'll even say equal to K, and C a clique. Right, and then I could also say then uh, and for all uh, uh, for all let's say C prime C prime does not uh, equal C uh, C prime is a, still a subset of V C prime is not a clique of size uh, greater than or equal to k plus one right. Something like this, right? You can define uh, this problem in this way. And in fact, this gives a, we would say exact clique. You can perform an, you could give an alternating machine that makes at most two jumps on any input. So it would be a, a, a sigma 2 machine. So this would be, we could say exact clique is then an element of sigma 2 uh, p, right? It's not obvious that this, this definition, though, is an NP. And in fact, because it requires, no matter how form you formulate it, you can't get rid of those two quantifiers. You could negate, double negate it, you could flip stuff around, who cares? There's no way, it, apparent way to get rid of the second quantifier. Uh, it's no way to even obviously permute quantifiers or anything like this. So it appears that exact clique is a problem that relies in uh, the second level of the polynomial time hierarchy. And it's believed there is no way to put this in NP. So we believe that such problems exist and that they reside on natural levels and can't be done fewer. Now, you could do 
you could come up with such a contrived problem that requires 10 quantifiers in the definition. But this is an example of one that may be interesting to you that requires at least two. Right? The condition here on exactness is what we need the second quantifier for. All other circuits, excuse me, circuits, all other cliques, all other subsets that are not equal to C are different. Right? Are not cliques of size K plus one more. Yeah. What do you mean checking K polynomial times? Like, um, like trying like K plus 1, K plus 2, up until like the size of the graph, G. Ah, how many subsets are, the, are, are there of the graph? Oh, exponential. Yeah. In fact, if you fix a clique, if you fix K, clique is in poly time. What is the size? How many subsets of size 5 are there? N choose 5 which is approximately O of n to the 5. So that's a polynomial time. If you fix k, it's actually polynomial time. Because k is part of the input, that makes this not probably not polynomial time. Probably np. In fact, each class has a complete problem. Uh, and you're not going to believe it that the complete problem is simply a generalization of, the, of sat. Um, we say a q a sat i, or q i sat or something like this. I'm not exactly sure. q i sat to be the problem of it's, of, it's a subset of, of uh, TQBF such that it only has a few quantifiers. Like, um, this is like Simpson exists x1 for all x2, da, 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 uh, and then you have a CNF, not a machine or anything, a CNF, and you have exactly i quantifiers, right? Q sat i in the first quantifier is an ex existential one. Um, it turns out that Q sat i uh, is. Uh, is uh, sigma i uh, complete. This is not too hard to prove, but to prove something would be sigma i complete, what we would first have to show is that q sat i is an element of sigma i p. Why is it an element of the ith level of the polynomial time hierarchy? This one's not, not uh, too hard to, to show. Uh, what is sigma IP again? We give three, di three definitions of it. Oracle definition is a little useless right now. Quantifier definition seems interesting, but let's put it aside. We have the alternating definition. You have an, a sigma I machine. It's simply going to branch on the quantifiers. Existential branch, I'm going to make existential quantifier, I'm going to make existential branch. Universal quantifier, I'm going to universal branch. This is a subset of TQBF, right? So it's this subset of TQBF is defined by the restricted version of the TQBF machine, the alternating polynomial machine. So it simply makes exactly those many quantifiers, I quantifiers, and it's done, QED. Questions on this? So this is a, this is a problem that's in, a, in sigma IP. We need to prove that it's sigma I hard. So what we mean is for all L, for all L in uh, sigma i p, there's a poly time reduction from L to uh, Q sat i. Why is there a reduction for all L in sigma i p to Q sat i? Encode in phi of i, the computation structure of the machine that you would use. Too many words, I need two words. Give me two words. Cook Levin. Cook Levin theorem. Okay, now what were you saying? Like you just like your your statement phi is just like like Cook Levin, you just encode the structure of your non-deterministic machine, and then you existed for all the like I guess like the best definition like the quantifier definition. Just, those are just literally your quantifiers. You just put them all together, and then your M machine yeah is just like in phi like it's encoded in phi. Basically, you basically uh, if something is in sigma IP, we need to know that W is an L if and only if. Let's say exists x1 for all x2, uh, something qi xi, m on w x1, uh, xi accepts. And then what you do is you just, by the Cook, by a similar construction to the Cook Levin theorem that has some details that we're going to ignore, you basically concern, convert m and w into a CNF, m, w, uh, that ex, that's not necessarily. 
like a sat CNF where it, it, the input to the sat CNF is just the ex exists. It exists, uh, it has an existential quantification on some variable and a, and a for all quantification on some others, and so on. And it sort of chains those together. And that'll end up being the QSAT instance. So basically, in two words, it's going to be Cook Levin through a complex construction, but uh, there's some details missing on that. But perhaps you can believe, if I left you to it, you could construct a, such a formula by the Cook Levin theorem. Right? This is one of those magic times. We're going to do this one more time, where you say, by a construction similar to the Cook Levin theorem, I could do that. I'm not going to, but I could. Give me an hour, and I'll do it, but I won't. Questions? Yes. Yes. Let's go back to clique. Let's go back to clique. Um, so it's an NP problem to find a clique of size exactly k and g, right? It is an no. It is an NP clique to f if g has a clique of at least size k. When you are given a clique, so consider the verifier definition. The polynomial time verifier takes as input the witness, which is the clique, and just checks it's of, it's of, it's of size k or more. Having a clique of size k does not guarantee that there isn't a bigger clique. Even if you ran that, like, from k up to the size of g, that's, where's the exponential coming? The exponential comes from the number of subsets of size. Uh, so you have v. A clique could be any subset of size, uh, any subset of v, right? The clique can be any subset of v. But there's two to the size of v possible subsets. So that ends up being exponential in the size of the graph. Now, k is not fixed. You may you'd be thinking, suppose k is 3 and then continuing, because then I only have uh, a polynomial number of subsets to check. The subset of size 3, 3 is a polynomial. But it's not just the subset of size 3. It's all the subsets, because k is actually part of the input. So as a function of the input, that is an exponential time algorithm. So it doesn't just routinely wash out. I guess what I'm saying is, if we can solve, we can solve clique on a non-deterministic Turing machine. Correct. So why can't we just do that a polynomial number of times? So consider, consider we tried on the non-deterministic Turing machine. The non-deterministic Turing machine will get us a clique. But how does, it, how does it ensure that it's the largest clique? It runs that from k to k plus 1 up to the size of g. On exponentially many branches? On a polynomial bounded machine? Even then, could you just do like a binary search then? So it's logarithmic, so then it becomes linear? Or am well, I getting confused? The problem is that you can't run, you can't like run a non-deterministic Turing machine, get its answer, and then choose for another one. So it'd have to be that like, let's say that I first find a clique of size k, and then I ensure that clique rejects on size k plus one. That means that at the end of every branch where I first accept because there would have been, like because there, I would have accepted because there is a clique of size k, oh, I see. then I have to rerun the whole non-deterministic thing and I have to ensure that every single branch rejects all the times that I want it to. Okay. That's not possible. Yeah. Got it, yeah. OK. Um, so each level of the polynomial time hierarchy has a, has a, has a complete problem, right? Um, let's talk about what the, what do we, like, we think about P versus NP. We have some assumptions about it. Let's talk about what we think happens to the polynomial time hierarchy. We drew it like a picture like that. But what were to happen if some level of the polynomial time hierarchy uh, was equal? Suppose that there exists some, suppose there is an I such that pi I is equal to sigma i. That implies that the entire polynomial hierarchy is contained within pi i. Pictorially, let's say we have this, right? This is some sigma i p, which is equal to some pi i p. Let's say after 25 quantifiers, they, the levels are equal. Okay? And then this is going to be pi i minus 1 p. We don't get any taller structure. So you, the way you should visualize this is like, we have a delicate balance of stilts, OK? If at any level the stilts were equal, there's just one point of failure now, then the whole hierarchy collapses. This, this does not exist. This is just the polynomial time hierarchy. Everything goes up to there. Um, so let's assume that pi i equals sigma i. And let's proceed. Consider uh, sigma i plus 1. What do we know about sigma i plus 1? This is equal to exists pi i p. Do we agree? 
by the definition of the, the quantification, right? But we know sigma i, pi i p is just sigma i by assumption. This is going to be exists sigma i p. What is exists sigma i p? Sigma i p. Why? Because you can combine the exists. Yeah, there's an existential, existential quantification over existentially beginning class. It doesn't matter. So this is just going to be sigma ip. So we prove that sigma i plus 1p is equal to sigma ip, qed. The next level collapses to the ith level. The i plus, why does this imply the entire hierarchy collapses, though? So can, suppose you had some like k greater than i, OK? Let's say you have sigma k to the p. That's just going to be equal to ex exists for all dot, dot, dot. Um, I don't know, exists for all uh, sigma i p. And this is going to be how many quantifiers? k minus i. This would be k minus i quantifiers. Now, if sigma i equals pi i, then this is just equal to um, for all exists, uh, exists for all pi i p k minus i. For all pi i, compress the quantifiers. How many quantifiers is this? k minus i minus 1. Oh, swap that again. For an existential, compress, swap, compress, swap, compress, swap, compress. Eventually, you'll get back to the ith level, the polynomial hierarchy. The entire level of the polynomial, the, all, everything above the ith level, if there exist two levels that are equal, uh, must collapse, right? If there exist two levels that are equal, the polynomial hierarchy, the polynomial hierarchy collapses. This is what is said. Now, we don't believe that the polynomial hierarchy collapses. We have very strong evidence that the polynomial hierarchy does not collapse. For the same reason, we believe that exact clique cannot be in NP. And exact clique is also probably not in uh, pi 2p. For the same reason, it's in sigma 2p. We don't believe it to be in so on, right? We believe each level of the hierarchy has these natural problems, which cannot be done in some other level of the hierarchy. So we believe each level of the hierarchy is strict and that they're all infinite, but we cannot prove it. We have no idea how to prove that the polynomial time hierarchy is infinite. Uh, in fact, this proves that if any two levels of the polynomial time hierarchy are, if this proves if two parallel levels of the, of the hierarchy are equal, if any single level is closed under complement, then the hierarchy collapses. But the hierarchy collapses in many other ways. Here's another way that the hierarchy collapses. Um, if any two levels on any, if any two uh, levels are equal, then the polynomial time hierarchy collapses, right? We'll prove a, a special case of that. Um, P, uh, if P equals NP, then what do we think polynomial, the polynomial hierarchy collapses to? P. P. Yeah. The entire polynomial hierarchy collapses to P if P equals NP. Think about our picture here. P equals NP basically means these two are, are the same. So this struct doesn't exist, and the whole ha tower has to fall over. Like if you think of it like Jenga, it's, it's easy to think about. If you remove that, this obviously the tower falls. Um, here's the proof. Uh, if p equals np, uh, then since p is closed under complement, we know that p is equal to np, which is equal to what? Co NP, yes. But NP is just sigma 1P, and co NP is pi 1P. So if sigma 1P equals pi 1P, that implies that PH collapses to uh, sigma 1 is equal to pi 1P. But we know that sigma 1 and pi 1, by assumption that P equals NP, is just P. QED. See how easy that statement was? Definition of the polynomial hierarchy, very difficult. Using a polynomial hierarchy is simple. You could have had a, you could have had that, this, this could have, this kind of proof could have came to you in a dream. 
you know, this is not a very difficult one, I think, for you to come up with. The use of the polynomial hierarchy is far easier than the definition. The definition contains all the baggage for us. Any questions on this statement? Right. The hierarchy collapses if any perturbance to any of its classes happen. Right? Yes? So with the counter positive, you just have to find a single problem that you can prove that's not in P but is in the hierarchy. Or that's in oh, the hierarchy. Oh, um, if the polynomial time hierarchy uh, is not contained in P, then P does not equal NP. Certainly. The hierarchy could still collapse, though, to level 10. That does not imply P does not equal NP, perhaps. Okay. Similarly, I'll let you prove if NP is equal to co-NP, uh, but not P. Then, the, then the, the polynomial hierarchy collapses to what level? It's possible that the hierarchy could collapse to NP, but not uh, P, right? It's possible NP, it's not plausible, but it's possible that NP is closed under complement and not equal to P, and the hierarchy would then collapse exactly to that level. Okay? Um... Every class we've done so far naturally has a complete problem. The py polynomial hierarchy is not one defined algorithmically. It's kind of odd. So does it have a complete problem or not? Let's see. Um, uh, it, the polynomial hierarchy has a complete problem, as in complete for the entire polynomial hierarchy, not for each level. We know each level has a, pol has a complete problem. We, I just erased it. But if there is a complete problem for the entire polynomial hierarchy, it turns out that the polynomial hierarchy collapses. This infinite tower falls apart if there is a complete problem for the entire class. This proof, also quite easy. Um, suppose that the polynomial time hierarchy has a complete problem, right? What does that mean? That means there is some A in polynomial hierarchy, and that for all L in the polynomial time hierarchy, that there is a reduction, a polytime reduction, from L to A. Let's suppose that there's such a complete problem for all of pH exists, OK? If A is in the polynomial hierarchy, that means uh, there is a K such that a is an element of sigma k. If it's in the polynomial time hierarchy, it's at some level of the polynomial time hierarchy. What happens next? You could do that. There's a simpler, short, shorter proof. That would work. That would collapse it down. The polynomial time hierarchy is closed under polytime reduction. So wherever you can put the complete problem in a class also closed under polytime reduction, goes the whole class. This is sufficient to prove to imply that the polynomial hierarchy goes wherever A goes, including sigma k. So it collapses. Wherever you can put this complete problem, you can put all the polynomial time hierarchy. If you can put the hierarchy, it has to exist at some level. So the, ho the whole hierarchy would also exist at, at some level, contradicting the fact that it would be infinite. Right? Uh, the reverse is even simpler. Uh, assume pH collapses to some level, let's say k, um, so let's say sigma k. Why does the polynomial hierarchy have a complete problem? Q sat k. Then Q sat k is complete. Is pH complete? Excuse me. So the polynomial time hierarchy cannot have a complete problem unless it collapses. We don't think it collapses. Proof also, again, I want to emphasize how simple the proof was relative how to how complex the definition of the polynomial hierarchy is. Right? You sort of play around with the levels without even remembering too much about what the definition is, just the relationship they have among each other. And then from that, you can get the, 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 the nice theorems out. So we mentioned that, um, well, any questions on this? We mentioned that the polynomial time hierarchy is contained in what, again? Pop quiz, done this a million times. What is the 
what is an upper bound on the polynomial time hierarchy? Yeah, polynomial time hierarchy is equal to p space. Uh, now, ironically, you may think everyone conjectures, every single person who learns this for the first time, they think, polynomial hierarchy definition, that just sounds like you're breaking up the definition of TQBF into steps. And then, like, isn't then when you take the union again, isn't that just TQBF? You would think that the polynomial hierarchy is just equal to P space. But th it turns out we don't think this to be true. If the polynomial hierarchy, ironically, as you grow the polynomial hierarchy, if the polynomial hierarchy equals p space, it collapses. So, sort of like an Icarus myth, as you fl fly too close to the sun, as soon as you, if you ever touch it, you burn yourself, and then you're not infinitely tall. You're only finitely many levels. Perhaps a large finite, who knows, but why is this true? Proof is one sentence. If pH equals P space, then TQBF is a P space complete problem, which proves. Yeah. P space has a complete problem. We proved that the polynomial hierarchy collapses if and if only if it has a complete problem. If the polynomial hierarchy equals p-space, then it has a complete problem. And if it has a complete problem, it collapses. QED. So ironically, infinite hierarchy has a ceiling. Kind of odd, but that's the structure. And we take this as evidence that p, because we think the polynomial hierarchy is probably strict, we're so certain that the polynomial hierarchy, the rungs are distinct. And we're so certain then that pH does not equal p-space. In fact, you could even define, similar to Leibniz's theorem in a very complex way, that there's a, probably a p-space intermediate in between polynomial hierarchy. There's something here and, and p-space complete. There's a little something in there. Who knows what it is, but it exists. All right. Questions on this theorem? Ironically, uh, we can prove the very related statement, pH is infinite, uh, implies that P does not equal P space. What's the proof? In fact, you can even get away with P not equal P space in a much simpler uh, thing. And what you can do is just suppose that there are two rungs that are distinct, and forget the rest. Now that implies the whole thing is infinite, but just suppose that there is sigma i, which is a strict subset of sigma j, for some i in j. Then what you get is that p is contained in sigma i, as long as i is greater than or equal to uh, 0, uh, p, which is contained strictly in sigma j, which is contained in p space. So obviously, from there, that implies that p is a strict subset of p space. For the same reason, so in fact, the fact that we think the polynomial hierarchy is infinite implies something else we also believe, that P doesn't equal P space. You know, complexity theorists have assumptions about like why classes behave the way they do. The reason they have those assumptions is because they're connected to other assumptions that are more natural than the assumptions that they have, right? We, we hope that the polynomial hierarchy is not, um, we, we think the polynomial hierarchy is infinite and that reinforces our belief that P doesn't equal P space. Right? Questions on that? All right, let's do the Karp-Lipton theorem. The Karp-Lipton theorem uh, is famous because it is a connection between uniform and non-uniform complexity classes. It was thought for a long time, and you saw when, when I drew the Venn diagram with p slash poly, it was thought for a long time that you could not relate uniform and non-uniform complexity bounds, and this theorem ended up being a counterexample to such a statement. The Karp-Lipton theorem sa says in the plain language, NP, if NP is contained in p slash poly, then that implies that the polynomial hierarchy collapses to, to the second level. 
Now, interpreting the statement of the, of the carpet lifting theorem is actually harder than the proof. What it says is if NP has polynomial sized circuits, the polynomial hierarchy collapses. One of the, my favorite reasons of the carpet lifting theorem is that it involves like 10 different things. There's a lot of moving parts. NP, we know. Circuits, polynomial hierarchy, collapse. Like four different little parts of each lecture are used to prove this great big theorem, right? Um, this is basically saying if, you know, SAT might be tractable in the sense that it, it, it was thought like, okay, sure, there's maybe no polytime algorithm for SAT, probably a polynomial size circuit family for SAT. This implies that we probably don't think there's a polynomial size circuit family for SAT because we don't think the polynomial hierarchy should collapse. The proof is actually simpler than this statement. We'll use a more specific and less general, general statement, which is that if SAT has a polynomial size circuit family, then we can put pi 2 inside sigma 2. If you can put pi 2 as a subset of sigma 2, it turns out that's enough to prove pi 2 equals sigma 2 by closure and things. I'll let you work that out. But this is, this is what we'll actually prove. Questions before we begin the proof? So if uh, sat is in p slash poly, there is a circuit family for sat. Uh, the circuit family is like C0, C1, such that CI takes us input a C and F and outputs a 1 or a 0, whether or not phi is satisfiable, right? It outputs a circuit, whether or not, it outputs a bit, whether or not that C and F is satisfiable. And we may assume that if SAT is in P slash poly, that the circuit family is polynomial sized. So assume SAT has a polynomial sized circuit family. Okay? Um, if this is a circuit family for the decision problem, there exists a poly sized circuit family uh, for the search problem. This polynomial size circuit family, suppose we call it C0k, C1k, C2k, C2 prime, and so on, right? The search problem here, what we mean is it takes as input a C and F and outputs the assignment. It doesn't output one bit if it's satisfiable or not. It outputs n bits, or O of n bits, to what the actual assignment is supposed to be. Why does there, if there exists a polynomial size circuit family for SAT, why does there exist a polynomial size uh, circuit family for the search problem of SAT? You just uh, pick one of the correct what do I call it, uh, assignments, and then you end that with the, the one that you got at the end to show, and then you just you know, output all of that instead of the one bit. You just wire through the correct uh, assignment to your output. So you don't know, though. That, that is a, a totally fair assumption that the algorithm that solves the decision problem for SAT also somehow implicit on its wires solves the search problem. And then you do wire that out. But what if it doesn't? What if it uses a Fourier transform and does something weird and it, it, doesn't, have the, it doesn't have the encoding search answer there. Now, that's a totally fair assumption to make, it, but suppose it doesn't. There's still an answer, it turns out. Which is the first bit, and then ask if it has an answer for the n minus 1 problem. If you fix the first bit as a 1, and if it doesn't, then you know that the first bit has to be 0. So like, if, if phi is in sat, and if phi and x1 is in sat, that implies um, that x1 is equal to 1. But if phi is in sat and phi and x1 is not in sat, that implies that x1 is n equal to 0, something like this, right? What you do is you just solve the problem n times. So what we can say is, the, what is the overhead cost? You just construct n copies of the circuit. So the size of the search version is approximately like O of n times the size of the decision version, something like this. You could, there's some and and ors and wiring you have to do, but that's what, that kind of what happens. So there exists a polynomial size circuit for the search problem of SAT. 
because there does exist one for this decision problem sat. Search the decision transformation. Okay? Assume sat is in p slash poly, and we proceed with the proof that uh, the polynomial hierarchy collapses. The way we'll show the polynomial hierarchy collapses, it will simply give, if sat is in p slash poly, we'll give a general method to permute quantifiers, something we know is illegal and not very nice. So we want to prove that pi 2 is contained in sigma 2. So what we'll do is begin with a general pi 2 statement. So let L be in pi 2. We know that uh, W is in L if and only if. Let's, what is this? For all x, there exists a y such that m on W x comma y accepts. We agree that's the definition of a pi 2 statement. Okay? We want to transform this into an equivalent sigma 2 statement. Um, notice that if sat is in p slash poly, uh, if sat is in p slash poly, we know that there's a polynomial size circuit family for sat, right? So in fact, uh, we can transform f into a CNF. Why is that true? What does the search problem for SAT output? It outputs the search, the search circuits for SAT output the witness. But the witness is outputted of this. This is like a witness extractor. Given the correct CNF, you can extract what the witness is supposed to be. So if SAT is in C slash poly, you can construct what's called phi of M, which is a CNF of M. M, and this exists by the Cook Levin theorem. Take m by the Cook Levin theorem, construct a CNF phi of m that does the same thing m does, right? With appropriate input variables for x and y. Now, if sat is a p slash poly, we discussed that there's a search version of the circuit sat such that um, there is a k such that c k prime on input phi of m uh, w and x outputs what? Let's suppose you created a, the polynomial size circuit takes as input the CNF M and then some auxiliary information to output the witness to M. What is that witness going to be? Of M on what? Well, what is that computation path encoded as? That, satisfying. I suppose what I'm, that's perhaps too deep of an answer. I suppose what I'm, the answer I'm looking for is why. That computation path will be encoded, it turns out, into y. But this polynomial size circuit family extracts from the CNF y, right? So in fact, we may use the polynomial circuit family and run m on a circuit with the CNF encoding of itself to extract the witness so we don't have to quantify over it. We say w is an l if and only if for all x m w x c k prime phi of m uh, w x. Now we don't need to quantify over y. We may simply extract y using the polynomial size, size circuit family on my own CNF. That's the hook of the whole theorem. There's a missing problem, though. There's one small part that's missing. We're almost done. We don't know what the circuit is, though. How do we know what the circuit is? This circuit has to exist, but we don't know how to find it. Non-deterministic Yeah, we're going to guess the circuit. Non-deterministically guess the circuit that's going to perform our witness extraction. It must exist because sat is in p slash poly. Then we're going to use that to extract y so I don't have to uh, quantify over y. Now I quantified over the circuit, though. This is an exists for all statement. W is an L if and only if exists for all. So what we have is that L is an element of sigma 2p. That's sufficient for us to show that pi 2 is in sigma 2. QED. Questions? You should have some.
This is the simple, the, the carp lipton theorem is a surprisingly simple and succinct statement, but the proof is creative, right? It was thought for a long time you couldn't, con you could not allow connections between uniform and non-uniform complexity classes. It was thought like you have P and P, P space, whatever, those are by themselves. And then over here you have P slash poly, P slash log, size and 10, whatever, you know, circuits and, and, and non-uniform classes. But it turns out that this was a connection between the two because the circuit, the existence of a circuit for SAT allows you to permute alternate quantifiers, right? This collapses the whole hierarchy for the same reason we mentioned uh, if any two classes are equal, collapse the hierarchy, because you can just keep alternating quantifiers and quantify over circuits all the way up. The trick here is that you perform witness extraction. You, you, you do a, from a search to decision transformation, you simply run the circuit to extract what you were supposed to be quantifying over by giving it a C and F of yourself. It's not quite diagonalization, but it's, it's called self-reducibility. This ends up extracting the witness for you so you don't have to quantify over it. Questions? At the end, you're left with a sigma 2 statement when you started with a pi 2 one. Now the quantifier dependence uh, ends up being swapped. Now you're quantifying over different things, but that's how it works. Right? When this t technique was found out, there was a, like, basically a gold rush of theorems people were trying to discover. Like, OK, uh, you know, we don't know anything about anything, but Using the polynomial hierarchy collapsing as a consequence, we can deduce lots of things. This is the reason we don't think that NP is contained in P slash poly. Right? This gives, we can't prove NP. If you could prove NP provably is not contained in P slash poly, that would prove P does not equal NP, because P is a subset of P slash poly. You can't prove this, but this gives evidence in favor that P does not equal P slash, P is, NP is not contained in P slash poly. Right? Questions? Let's do another one. Uh, let's do another carp lipton style theorem. This is from the same paper. It's by Albert Meyer. It's, uh, I don't know, it's called Meyer's theorem. It basically says if exponential time has polycyte circuits, then uh, exponential, uh, exponential time is contained in sigma 2. The second level of the polynomial hierarchy, which is just NP to the NP, contains uh, um, all of exponential time. And by the way, sigma 2 collapse, uh, exponential time being contained in sigma 2 has huge implications for P space and so on, right? It, 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 and P versus P space itself, that's a lot it comes with. I'll leave it to you as an exercise to determine what are the consequences of exponential time being contained in sigma 2, what bad things happen. Right? The proof follows from a similar construction as uh, the cook levin theorem. If L is in XP, what do we know? We know there's an exponential time machine for this. So we know that uh, there is a sequence of configurations. Uh, let's say z0 to z2 to the n to the k for some k. So in fact, uh, we can say w is an L not if uh, the exponential time machine accepts, but if each of these configurations can satisfy some very small checkable uh, conditions. If each of these configurations can be uh, syntactically checked by a machine that just does very simple checks, like the first one is a start configuration, the next one follows, last one is accepting configuration, then we can determine that the machine accepts. So in fact, we'll write this T as like a checker, W uh, Z0, Z2 to the n to the k. This machine accepts. This is, not a, this is not a simulator of the exponential time machine. It just checks each of the configurations of it, right? Um, if xp is contained in p slash poly, then uh, there is a poly size circuit family. Uh, circuit family. Such that c on input i will output the ith configuration. Normally, to output the ith configuration, you have to you know, exponentially run the machine, right? But if xp is in p slash poly, then there exists a machine to do that. 
So now we're simply going to create a different machine that doesn't check all configurations, but is allowed access to a single quantifier and just uh, checks one. We'll call it T prime. There's still one problem, though. How do we get what the circuit family is? How do we get what the circuit is? Yes. Yeah, we're just going to guess the circuit family. So we're left with L being a language from exponential time. This here can imply that that's a sigma 2 statement, though. So L is an element of sigma 2. A worse proof, I think, than the carpet lifting theorem one, but still basically the same technique. You can quantify a circuit is a finite device you're allowed to quantify over. You can perform a quantification over the existence of such a circuit, and that allows all kinds of all kinds of tricks and techniques for such a thing. Right? Questions on this proof? I'll show you an implication of uh, Myers theorem. So. Lower bounds are really hard to prove. Uh, we don't really have any strong ways to prove lower bounds on problems, right? Proving an upper bound on a problem is easy. What you do is you just show that there exists an algorithm to solve the problem. Proving a lower bound on a problem is hard because you show for all possible algorithms and none of them can do it. But it turns out that you can connect upper bounds with lower bounds. If uh, p is equal to np, then that implies that uh, xp is not contained uh, in p slash poly. What is this? P equals NP is a poly time upper bound on non-deterministic computation. XP not in P slash poly is a circuit size lower bound on exponential time. We believe XP is not in P slash poly, but this is an upper bound statement, which implies a lower bound on a different class. Let's prove it. Assume, suppose uh, uh, P is equal to NP, but XP is contained in uh, P slash poly. If p equals np, what do we know happens to the polynomial hierarchy? Yeah. So the polynomial hierarchy is contained in p, right? And we just proved that if xp is in p slash poly, we also know that xp uh, is contained in sigma 2, right? Sigma 2 is in the polynomial hierarchy. And the polynomial hierarchy, if p equals np, is just p. So we can prove exp is contained in p. What's the contradiction? E is a strict subset of xp, right? What's the name of the theorem? p is a strict subset, unconditionally, of xp. Why is p contained in xp contained in p a contradiction? The name of the theorem. Time hierarchy theorem. All right, I have one more quick proof for you. Any questions on this one? Yes. Can you, positive, but can't you like not assume two things and then do a proof for contradiction? Because I think that's kind of. We assumed, when you do a proof by contradiction of p implies q, and in fact, there is a simpler contrapositive proof, but I, I got confused on it, so I did the contradiction proof. I was, when I was working this out like three hours ago. You assume p but not q, p implies q, to, to assume to the contrary, p but not q. So you do p equals np, but xp is contained in p slash poly. If p equals np, then p is h is in p. And if xp is in p slash poly, we know by Meyer's theorem that xp is in sigma 2, which is in p, which is in p, yeah. OK, I have one more uh, theorem for you. Um, and it's the only circuit lower bound that we really know ever of all time. That's not really true, but it's, it might as well be. Uh, this is called uh, Kanan's theorem, or Kanan, Ravi Kanan. Uh, Kanan's theorem basically 
really creatively proves the existence of a language. There exists some LK, which is an element of a sigma 2 P, but not in size n to the K. So there's a, so LK is in NP with an oracle for NP, but does not have polynomial size circuits. Now this does not resolve any questions of NP versus PH or PH versus uh, uh, P slash poly. Those are still open questions. We have no idea how to resolve those. But it is conjectured. Um, so like we proved for the time hierarchy theorem that like time uh, n to the k was a strict subset of time uh, n to the k plus 1, right? But this does not imply, for example, that p does not equal p, right? So the fact that this language is not done in size n to the k does not imply that this language is not, does not have a polynomial size circuit, because it could be uh, that uh, LK is in size uh, uh, n to the 2K, or something like this, right? It's simply each polynomial has a different language, it turns out. Each, for each polynomial, there's a language in sigma 2P that is not in size n to the K, but it may be requiring a larger polynomial. This is Conant's theorem, right? So we begin with the uh, uh, the start. First, we're going to put L. We're going to put LK not in sigma 2P, but in sigma 4P. And then we'll show how to reduce that to sigma 2P. The, tr the trick we'll do here is we'll put it in sigma 4P by programming an alternating machine that uses at most four quantifiers. And it'll use those four quantifiers to ensure that no polynomial size, no size n to the k circuit correctly decides the same language. Here's the machine description. This is our sigma 4 machine. Uh, on input. Now again, a sigma 4 machine has alternation. It's going to do, first it's going to do, uh, let, 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 in, let n be the size of w. It's going to do a existential branch. There exists a circuit C prime uh, of size n to the 2k plus 5. Now, what is n to the 2k plus 5? We have what's called a non-uniform Hayek theorem. You can use a non-constructive counting argument to see how, much, how many more asymptotic gates do you need to decide more languages, like we proved for Shannon, the Shannon-Muller lower bound. It ends up 2 to the k plus 5 ends up being sufficient to uh, ensure it's, it is asymptotically different than n to the k. That's sufficient. We, we're going to universally quantify over, excuse me, existentially quantify over circuit C star. And then for all circuits C prime, uh, circuits of size uh, n to the k plus 1, we're going to say that there exists a y of uh, size n such that uh, C star y does not equal uh, c prime y. We've only used three quantifiers now. And it turns out there's some more. But it, the, the depth of this machine only uses uh, four qu quantifiers up to four depth. It uses a, exists, a for all exists. And then in some more steps, it'll use an additional for all. I won't specify what those steps are, because they're kind of baggage, and they get in the way of the cleanliness of the proof. But understand, there's a little more fine-tuned detail there that puts this language in a sigma 4, right? This is a sigma 4 machine, right? There's another going to be, there's going to be universal quantifier down here somewhere. It's just baggage. This step is the important part of the algorithm, though. Why? What is this, what is this doing? Diagonalizing against all size and the k circuits. This is a diagonalization proof. You use your four quantifiers to perform a diagonalization. You say, oh, all circuits C prime of size n to the k, there is a y, our diagonal, that I'm different on. For each circuit of size n to the k plus 1, I'm different than one of you. Each of you, I'm different than all of you on one square, some y. right? I ensure, then, that this is, because this is a, a, sigma, 4K, a sigma 4 machine, it's in sigma 4, and because it diagonalizes against size n to the k, it's not in size n to the k. So we have constructed this language lk, which is in sigma 4 and not in size n to the k. 
I won't specify the details there. You can read it if you want. It's just baggage in the way to make sure the machine does correctly simulate the circuits on all inputs and so on, right? It's not something weird going on. Questions on that construction before we put it in sigma 2? OK, so we have constructed a language in sigma 4 that does not have circuits of size n to the k. We have two cases. Case 1, sat is in, uh, sat is not in p slash poly, and sat is in p slash poly. If sat is not in p slash poly, what do we know about the circuit size of sat? If sat is not in p slash poly, sat does not have polynomial size circuits, right? So we know that sat is in uh, sigma 2 and not in size n to the k. So there exists a language in sigma 2 which is not in size n to the k if sat is not in p slash poly. Now what if sat is in p slash poly? What happens if sat is in p slash poly? What are the consequences of sat being in p slash poly? To be specific, which is true, polynomial hierarchy collapses to sigma 2. But sigma 4, then, is a subset of sigma 2, because the whole polynomial hierarchy collapses. So then we have LK, which is now an element of sigma 2, and still not in size n to the k. Either way, one of the languages, L, is either, it's either sat or it's going to be LK. Which one? We don't know. Non-constructively, though, it's one of the two. Whichever case it is, it's in NP to the NP. It's in sigma 2, but not in size n to the K, QED. Conan's theorem. Beautiful application as almost like a corollary to the Karp-Lipton theorem. Non-constructively, we know there is a language that does not have n to the K size circuits, which is in NP to the NP. Now, what the language is, we have no idea. Unfortunately, we have failed to prove circuit lower bounds on any language. We only have weird results like this one, or the Shannon counting argument, where we non-constructively say, yeah, there has to exist a circuit of not this size or something. Well, we have no idea what the circuit actually is. But we know in either case, whichever world we're in, one of these two things must be true, and we're in one of them. Any questions on Conan's theorem? If not, I'll, I'll leave you with one more sentence, which is that it, previously I mentioned you know, why graph isomorphism is NP-intermediate and probably not NP-complete. We mentioned that subgraph isomorphism was NP-complete. It is known that uh, if graph isomorphism is NP-complete, uh, then pH collapses. I won't bore you with the details of this proof. It's actually very different than a carp lipton style collapse. But if graph isomorphism is NP-complete, then the polynomial hierarchy collapses. We don't think the polynomial hierarchy collapses, so graph isomorphism is probably not NP-complete. QED. Questions? What is our sigma-4 machine like? How does it actually choose to accept or reject? It has access to quantification, and it makes a it non-deterministically guesses a circuit as IC. Then co non deterministically chooses all circuits of n size n plus 1 and ensures non deterministically for each one of those, I'm going to choose a string that I'm different on each of those circuits with. Yes. Yes. How does it accept or reject? Oh, it's going to diagonalize. It's, going to, it's in the details that I'm missing here. But it'll like accept. It'll like do the opposite of what y does on all this. Like. Let me think. Um, it's like, well, when should it accept w? I think it should accept w if and only if w is equal to y, or vice versa, or something. w is accepted by a larger circuit, but not by the size n, plus, n to the k plus 1 circuit. OK, if w is equal to y. I can see that. Um, I don't know. That makes sense to me, because w is not, ex if it's, yeah, actually, it should be W. Excuse me, it should be Y. Because Y is, a, is rejected, quote unquote. It's not a true assignment of each circuit of size n to the k plus 1 on each of them. 
So no circuit family of size n to the k plus 1 decides this language, because it chooses one from each. So it should be, it should be y. Yeah. We agree, though, at least with the diagonalization. Yeah. Questions? All right.